Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. Yes, it's entirely different. Yes, I'm back in the old lab, and yes, I don't, or no, I don't have anything behind me, except this uh, dumpster dive in Sonique TV, which you've uh, seen on the second channel, because I'm doing this as a, a test of a concept of uh, going to use, instead of like a green screen or something, crap like that, in case I take something green out of the mailbag, it's just not gonna work, and they look crap, no matter how hard you do it. And have an actual TV behind me where I can include photos of people's labs. So you can send in a picture of your lab, and I put it up on the screen as I do mailbag. Let me know down below, please, if you think that is a good idea. So yes, I, this is a 55 inch TV that I found in this dumpster, but I need about a 70 inch to like get the entire frame coverage. So it seems like it's just like a backdrop. So anyway, um, I'm just testing the concept here. And yes, I have, uh, well, haven't fully installed proper lighting in my new lab uh, yet, or my old lab. I don't know what to call it, old, new, whatever. Anyway, the lab, um, which I'm moving back into, by the way, eventually, uh, in a few more months, or oh, well, slowly over the next couple of months. If you don't know, those of my supporters will already have seen videos of the old slash new lab and all the economics behind it and, and the move and all that sort of jazz. Anyway, let me know what you think down below. So yeah, apologies for not the world's best lighting, but I thought I'd try it out. And yes, I do have a much smaller mailbag bench. And this was originally my uh, soldering bench that I used um, in here in, in the old lab. So yeah, I don't need my mailbag benches. Typically, I think it's 2.1 meters by 900 millimeters deep. It's, it's insanely big. And of course, because I'm downsizing to the old lab, um, yeah, I just, I don't need that. So this is like a perfect size bench. So I'm going to use this for mailbag bench now. Anyway, Let's get into it. Mailbag. Thank you very much. And there's and the lab's completely empty, so the audio, if it's a bit echoey, meh. And yes, of course, this is famously Jim Williams's old lab, which they actually preserved, or they preserved, uh, I think, this bench uh, part of it here, and you can see it in the computer. I think it's the Computer History Museum. Please correct me down below uh, if it's wrong. I've been to the Computer History Museum. Absolutely fantastic. Anyway, um, yeah, so there you go. Let me know about that idea. I can be in anyone's do mailbag from anyone's lab. I think it's cool. I've got to be careful of like reflections off the screen and stuff. So I'd hate to buy like a big expensive uh, 70 inch TV because I'm not going to find a 70 inch in the dumpster. I have found a 65. 65 is actually just not big enough. It needs to be 70 inch, I believe. I've done the uh, framing measurements for that. So yeah, don't want to buy it and then find it's got some huge reflective screen which doesn't work or something. So, yeah, I don't know, especially when I have like a studio, I'm probably like going to have like two, I normally have two uh, studio lights either side of me. So, you know, you've got to angle those right, but it should be, it should be okay. You just can't put them too close and then it reflects off there straight in the lens. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Oleg Kutov um, from the Ukraine. Hi to all my Ukrainian viewers. Got some cool stamps here, let me show you. Haven't had stamps for a while and the camera's so far back, I've got to get off the bench and go approach the camera. But uh, yeah, that might be a thing in the future. So anyway, um, yeah, I'm gonna need a 70 inch TV. But yeah, nice stamps, look at them. And there's tons of them, awesome. Love stamps, that's terrific. So let's get into it. Tongue at the right angle. All right, this is absolutely enormous box. Let's have a look at, yeah, I don't like having the camera so far back. It's like two meters back at least. And I can't just like, like usually it was like just like a meter away and I could sort of like reach forward, lean forward and show stuff to the camera. So anyway, that might, but to get the frame in, it's gotta be like for this screen, meh. Anyway, we have a note. Um, hi Dave, thank you very much. Uh, to Red, and, ooh, yes. We like this here on the EEV blog. Hands up. If you remember these, <laughs> look at this eight inch floppy. Wow, now that five and a quarter inch rubbish, genuine eight inch jobby, fantastic. And we've got some sort of original uh, listing on there or something like that. Anyway, I started, I didn't start on eight inch floppies. I'm not that old. Started on five and a quarter inch floppies. I used to sell software and mail out five and a quarter inch floppies and then three and then went three and a half and then newfangled three and a half inch uh, floppies came along even though they were hard case they weren't floppy anymore like these are um anyway what do we got so yeah that was fun when you had to actually uh use the 
Here's the old floppy disk mailer, the cardboard mailer. You can still buy those, it's still a thing. So we have some sort of vintage computery thing. Great thing about an empty lab is you can just throw stuff off the bench and there's plenty of room. It's great. I know it's in there. Ah, oh, speaking, of, oh no, uh, 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 that's the iOmega Zip. Wonder if it has the click of death. Hands up if you remember the click of death from the iOmega Zip drive. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of like um, two minute teardowns. That's some sort of, uh, oh, a 3G CDMA thing. But what's this? Is this an old computer thing? I think uh, it's just, I think he's just sent in a bunch of random stuff. And we do have an old board, which will go over. Green, doesn't have the crinkly solder mask. It's not that old. Oh, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Ooh, wonder what that does. We'll check it out, cool. Oh, we've got a USB to RS-485 isolator, which Oleg has uh, designed. It's got his name on it, so beauty. Don't even have to read the note to know it's his when you put your name on the silk screen, and you should, even if your company doesn't say. You know, if you're a PCB designer at the company, even if they don't say, put your in, don't put your initials or your name on the PCB, there's plenty of places to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that. Cool. So I got, um, we'll have a look at all that. Old and new. And Oleg is sending some awesome photos here. This is a sunset over the Black Sea in Crimea. Look at that. Beautiful. And this is Orion plus the horse head and flame. Oh, I love some astrophotography. Beautiful. Oh, sorry about the bloody reflections. Flesh, lighting's so hard, you know, when you've got glossy paper like this. Well, gl you know, <laughs> glossy anything. So he's worked in the astrophysical field, he's now living in Kiev, working in uh, networking in telecoms. So he's sent in some random stuff. The big board is a quite a unique device from the Soviet era. The uh, USSR, back in the USSR. You don't know how lucky we are, boy. This is the main board of the mainframe computer terminal device, the Mira CM7209. Hands up if you've heard of this. It's a Z80-based computer with limited software and hardware. Uh, it consists of a video monitor keyboard printer optionally and was connected to the mainframe, uh, typically ES series or clone of the IBM 360 using serial port provided access. Wow, look at that. So, uh, yeah, it's like inside the keyboard. Thing. No, dumbass Dave, keep reading. The board was placed on the back side of this Monda and directly connected to the video amplifier. What is most interesting in the components on this board, you can find uh, USSR, Czech, East German, Z80 CPU clone, and even Japanese parts. MCU Mitsubishi is responsible for the video airport. Unfortunately, this board is dead, but some of the ROMs can be read. Save this board from a dumpster at the Crimean Astrophysical Observatory. Brilliant. And he doesn't know if the data can be read from the 8-inch floppy because uh, he doesn't have one. And, well, unfortunately, neither do I. Oh, look at this bad boy. <laughs> Genuine Soviet era. Love it. Right, what does it need? 3.3 volts. That's interesting. It wasn't like I expected, like 5 volt only. Anyway, 5 volts minus 12 and plus 12, that would be for the uh, serial comms, of course. Uh, but most of it would be 5 volts, I'd be guessing. So yeah, hands up if you spot anything familiar. <laughs> Not much Western stuff. Uh, there you go. We've got some genuine uh, acrylic. There's a sync. Is that like sync ROM? Maybe that's like video sync. So that would be, would that be the video? I, I have no idea. Anyway, got ourselves old school ROM down there. That's an SGS jobby. Nice ceramic ROM there. Got ourselves some RAM. And yeah, um, yeah. There's very little. Oh, there's a there's a Signetics one. There's a Signetics one and uh, oh, TI from Portugal. There you go. So they were able to get some Western parts in this thing. Yeah, this is just classic though. Look at that. <laughs> anyway, dates from uh, 87, summer 88 by the looks of it. Um, yeah, 88, 09, things like that. So there's the Z80 uh, CTC and the uh, Serial I.O. Oh, there we go. 8255. There it is. NEC. Japanese jobby. Another uh, TI part. Guess they smuggled them out of Portugal, did they? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> anyway, a few mod wires on there. Love it. Got to have a couple of mod wires. Bit of hot snot. No, that's a that's a plastic spacer. It looked like hot snot from back here, but uh, <laughs> why they bother? Like, I don't know, would you bother on a board like this? You know, usually not, but anyway, there you go. That's fascinating. Soviet era board. And of course, you know, look, it's all uh, it's all right angle stuff in here and it'll all be uh, auto routed, I would imagine. And of course, all horizontal, 
on the top here, on the bottom, you're going to see all vertical. Yep, all vertical. There you go, because that's how you route it. Oh, why why they got the connector on the back? Anyway, that's interesting. And uh, that BNC that they had on the front, they just wire that jobby over. That's interesting, but that's how you laid out um, like <laughs> complex double-sided bores like this. Um, or you know, I mean, this one's double-sided because otherwise, if it was all uh, if there were internal layers, you wouldn't have your nice big power strips coming down like this. But this is how you uh, efficiently auto route a double-sided, like a large, complicated digital, uh, densely populated digital board like this on two layers. One horizontal, one vertical. If you try going willy-nilly, you're going to come a gusser in your routing pretty quick. And this is a 3G CDMA modem, uh, 450 meg for those playing along at home. And back in 2008, this was the only way that uh, OLED could get on the interwebs. So, yeah, <laughs> it's not going to be much in it, is there? Oh, still got the original SIM card. Hands up if that was your uh, provider. It just feels really chintzy. Ah, Oleg says this is not a SIM module, it's an RUIM module. It looks like a SIM, but it's not compatible with a regular SIM. So, something tells me the uh, external antenna, is it? <laughs> it's Kamigatsa. What on earth is going on in there? Um, like, is, is this the antenna? Like, uh, it's folding back like that, it's going, like... Okay, it's symmetrical. I'm liking that. Um, oh, what the heck is that? That's just really bizarre, isn't it? Anyway, got a metal shielding can on there. And there you go. Um, yeah, we won't go into any detail on this. Samsung, there you go. So I'll just show you a quick close-up of what's on here. You can, oh yeah, Qualcomm. Yeah, it's all the, all the usual culprits. No worries. That's on the top side, under the can. More Qualcomm. Yep, Qualcomm as far as the eye can see. So, this has to be the antenna, and it's all it's all coming to guts now. Look at this, it's just uh, held up. Oh, oh, nope, that <laughs> just snapped in half. It's just held in there, all the metal's just held in place with little uh, plastic um, studs melted. And yeah, I, they're getting an antenna out of this. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And I presume it's like a, uh, a dual diversity antenna, is it? And yep, that's it. Um, and it just uses um, contacts down the bottom like that. So uh, yeah, that is, that's, oh, okay. Yep, so that's, they are the inner ones of the ground there. And the two outer ones are the two sides of the antenna. Neat. So uh, yeah, they went to a lot of effort to form that. That's really interesting. Has anyone seen anything like that before? I don't think I have. I haven't seen one like formed like that, especially one that like goes over the edge like that. That's, uh, that's, oh, is that part of, is that part of the ground? Yes, that's the ground one, because there's the ground there, goes down there. So this is, this top side here is the ground, and that one there is the antenna, the one I ripped off there, is uh, the antenna by the looks of it. But, oh no, no it's not. No it's not. Look at that. It goes in there, folds back, and goes down to that other contact. I'd, okay, and then it goes across here. Uh, so it's we, we've got some stubby action happening. Love a good stubby. Um, I, yeah. Anyway, um, antenna experts out there want to analyze that? Please go for it. Leave it in the comments. Um, a lot of people will be interested, I'm sure. It's fascinating. And hands up if you remember the iOmega zip drive, it's okay. Does that mean this one doesn't have the clip and click of death height assembled in Malaysia? Hi to all my Malaysian viewers. Yes, the iOmega zip drive 250 meg that stood for back when we only have 1.44 meg floppies and we had maybe what a couple of hundred meg hard drives or something like that. Um, I can't remember the exact date or what hard drives were at at the time, but yeah, iOmega zip was the way. Um, it was just a disc, you know, it was real high density uh, disc in, in like a hard case, like a three and a half inch uh, floppy. And were, were these backward compatible with the three and a half inch floppy? I can't remember. Used to have one. Anyway, um, yeah, this was where you backed up all your stuff, was onto iOmega zip drives. But they had the famous classic uh, click of death. If you heard it go click, 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 um, you knew that. Yeah, I can't remember what the exact fault was, but yeah, the iOmega zip drive. Um, <laughs> hands up if you still got a backup on iOmega zip drives. Wow. 
and there's no screws at all holding that together. Oh, wow, I've never taken apart one before. There's nothing in it. Wow, it, that's just, it. yeah, it's naff all. It's got a plastic uh, shield. Oh, look, look at that. Yep, the whole, the whole mechanism just slides like that. Wow, that's interesting. There's a light pipe up there going to the uh, front panel. Oh, no, that's, that's the button, is it? A button and uh, combined button and light pipe. Um, wow. Yep, so there's really not much at all, but that's... Check this out, it actually slides upwards, and so you push the disc in and then it comes upwards, I guess, like that. And don't know why it needs to come upwards, it's got to go over the, maybe the PCB at the back. Um, interesting. Oh wow, that just slid out, that came out far too easily. Um, <laughs> wow, <laughs> made in China by Nide Nidec, motor in there, a spindle motor, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty simplistic. Look at that. Just one polycarb plate like that. And, uh, yeah, anyway. Well, I won't give up my uh, day job <laughs> to repair iAmiga zip drives. Oops. Um, yeah, there's a way to take these apart, I'm sure. Just a random rod. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Nothing to see behind the curtain. Um, there we go. There, uh, there's our coil. Okay, so the, wow, that's really simplistic, isn't it? Check that out. There's our two magnets. These, these two magnets just sit in there like that. And then the coil, the moving coil, just moves uh, like along like that. Wow, that's a real cheap and... I'm not going to say cheap and nasty, is it? But... Uh, but uh, that's a real cheap way to do it. Like there's no gear, and no cogs um, or anything like that. How you do it with a traditional uh, stepper motor. Maybe they couldn't get uh, the fine resolution required um, to use like a traditional stepper motor and then and one of those like, uh, you know, linear uh, bearing thing. Oh, God, tell I'm not a mechanical engineer, can't you? Anyway, that, that's fascinating. So that, whoop, yeah, so that would slide back and forth across there and there's your head double-sided is that a double-sided jobby? <laughs> I really butchered this <laughs> well, there it is so that'd be some sort of uh is that a, is that a TI? I think that's TI isn't it? yep there you go anyone want to look up that part number but uh, there you go there's not much on there but obviously um, the coil is all part of that and then there's your head down the bottom um, <laughs> I totally ruined it, but anyway, is it, no, does it float, in? oh god, yeah, I've totally screwed the pooch, haven't I? Wow, anyway, um, yeah, that was a head, give that a flippity doo da. yeah, it, was it on the top and bottom as well, there's definitely something down there on the bottom, yeah, top and bottom, I think it's a double-sided jobby, so yeah, I find that fascinating to, like, replace the linear bearing with that, um, Anyway, let us know if that's the problem and how the click of death actually manifested itself. So if we get rid of that, like, there's not much doing in there. Don't really need to talk about that. But uh, another TI, yeah, TI had the win, the design win there. But, geez, yeah, there's not much in the old... Oh, what? What? What is that? What is that? Uh, Bueller? Did I break something off or is that... Uh, how it's supposed to be it's like a like a right angle flat flex thing maybe I did oh right uh, that's that's the head okay I think uh, yep that looks like it was the head attachment <laughs> so that's how it just, just just sheared off like that wow I've never had that happen before geez I must have put some force on that whoops yeah not giving up my day job and Oleg made these uh, RS-485 to USB isolators uh, for use in the observatory. So, yeah, there you go. Roll your own. No worries. Got a little uh, DC to DC converter there that uh, provides the isolation, of course. Nice little layout. Like it. They might come in handy if I need to do RS-485 videos. You can uh, check these out. Apparently, he's got uh, details over on his website, Oleg Ku. I think it's Kutov with a K with a silent K in there, dot me. Um, I could be wrong on the pronunciation. Of course I'm wrong on the pronunciation. I always am. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's neat. So thank you very much, Oleg, for sending out a whole bunch of just random and uh, vintage stuff like this. I always wanted to tear apart. I've always had, I've kept my um, iOmega zip drive. I always wanted to uh, tear it down. But uh, yeah, like, there's nothing doing in there at all. Amazing. Anyway, thanks, mate. Mm.
Thank you very much, Robert Alexander from Northwood in the United States of America. Yes, if you are going to send in your mailbag, send in to PO Box 7949, Borkham Hills, New South Wales, 2153 Australia. Actually, it's not Borkham Hills anymore. They renamed it Norwest. So technically, you should put Norwest, but it's still going to get here. Good thing is, I've got the existing uh, keyboard tray under here. I can just whip out, because um, I don't want to use the Crocodile Dundee knife with um, what is obviously some sort of, uh, well, it says, spoiler alert, it says photograph, but is it like a poster or... Uh, or something like that. Seal for our protection. It is actually a photograph, I believe. That looks like photo paper. Oh yes, the Byte magazine covers. Oh, I got a new Byte magazine cover. I don't recognize this one. I do not recognize that one. These are awesome. Oh, I'll put the link in, but yeah, Byte magazine covers. Yeah, these are just absolutely fantastic. He's recreated from scratch the Byte magazine covers. Hasn't just copied them, and he's, yes, he's got the permission of the original um, author, apparently. So, yeah, um, I've got some you know, really good ones um, up in the, well, the current lab, and these are absolutely fantastic. So, highly recommend these. You can actually get them different sizes, I believe, but uh, yeah, this is nice. <laughs> yeah, the old Byte covers back in the day. Hand, uh, hands up if you actually remember these. These are fantastic. Yes, Robert Tinney is the original uh, creator of these Byte magazine cover artworks and he's got uh, Robert's permission to actually uh, recreate these. So this is just his uh, latest one. This is the April 1983 cover of Byte magazine. Great stuff. And this is supposedly, it's called Inside IBM. This is terrific. Link down below, bytecovers.com. Thank you very much, Richmond Technology in uh, Philadelphia. Great. Uh, hi to Fran. Fran's in Philly. And uh, she, she got the masks I sent, thankfully, because yeah, apparently you can't buy them. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, the story behind that is in the cupboard just over here, when I got this lab back from the previous uh, tenant who was renting it, they just left a box of like 10, uh, brand new seal box of 10 masks behind because they did actually uh, install new walls and they painted and sort of did some little mini renovations in here and there. Obviously from that, and they left them behind. So yeah, friend needed some masks, so I sent her a whole bunch of, whole, I sent her the box of uh, masks, which is terrific, because she can now get them here. They're just dime a dozen, you know, along with hand sanitizer and everything else. What do we got here? All right, what, oh, we got, we got smoke alarms. I've already done some, is there a note? Smoke detector electronics for testing. So we'll do a quick uh, two minute tear down, but uh, I've already um, done a video on Smoke alarms, although I was going to do a follow-up one which involved, uh, what was it? I can't even remember what it was. Was it something to do with power factor or something? Um, anyway, I, yeah, I was going to do a follow-up. We'll do a quick, quick squiz, but is that the same brand that I did the, uh, um, the teardown videos on before? Hmm. Anyway, that was about um, standby current consumption. Well, I can't remember the videos I've done. There's so many. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure why an anonymous person has sent in a couple of uh, smoke alarms like this. Maybe they haven't seen my uh, video about... Well, it wasn't really. Uh, smoke alarms was just the example that I used of how uh, bad product design can kill the environment. In this case, having like massive um, standby uh, power consumption in these things and you know you have to get into the whole real complex uh, argument and stuff like that. I was going to do a follow-up video. I'm sure it was on maybe some aspect of uh, complex power or something like that. I can't really remember but yeah there's nothing really um, that interesting in these things. These things are in really built down to a price. You've got your uh, sensor here and maybe we can uh, tear that down, but then you've got your, uh, your beeper, your sounder, and here's another one, um, very similar, and they really, like, uh, you know, cheap out on everything, like, like the switch is like a piece of folded sheet metal like that, contacting just a link on the PCB, because you've got to put the links on there anyway, because this is like a, a single-sided board to get the uh, cost down, and there's like, yeah, they... I really like this one's got wires wow you know look coming all the way over here and uh going over to the um like a buzzer over here with the uh, the you know piezo sounder with the wires whereas this one um doesn't they've they've got the cost down even more there so there's just going to be one single uh custom asic on the bottom of this controlling the whole thing caution Ooh, radioactive <sighs> yeah this one here is actually really uh quite 
impressive. I like how they've got the uh, posts up here, which then make contacts with these little stamped metal uh, battery contacts over here. That's that's really quite something. They've used a real, um, <laughs> and they spent no expense there with the uh, a proper tactile switch there. Wow, gilded the lily. But uh, yeah, there's nothing in these things. It's just the. Uh, well, where, where is? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, the main ASIC is um, it's it's under the bottom. There, there you go. It's a dip jobby. There you go. That's a sensor. There's nothing else in there. Of course, it's going to because this is a uh, radioactive one. It's going to have a little bit of a mercurium. Where is it? One micro curies. Is it seventy something maximum? I don't know. Uh, yeah, bloody serial number on it. Anyway, they're going to have a little tiny minute amount in there. No, it's not. Uh, it's not dangerous. Yep, there's our dip uh, chip, and you know, save space, keep it all nice and compact. Put the dippy under underneath. No wackers. And um, yeah, that's like all it is. Um, it's just an ionizing ionizing detector. So I'm not sure of the actual physical mechanism of it, but uh, basically how it works is that they just apply apply a voltage uh, to it and uh, like the metal can here they call this, this is like the ionization chamber and uh, when you apply a voltage across the americurium uh, 241 that they've got in there, then it uh, produces like a small current and then that current will change if you get a um, smoke particles in there and that's that's all it is to it really so yep it's just a uh, cheap and cheerful way to do it of course uh modern ones um uh, the another method is the photoelectric uh method where you can actually uh, look at like you uh, shine like an infrared lead uh through a you know a similar kind of uh, chamber thing and look for the uh, particles that uh, disrupt that when they enter um and uh, like you know there's pros and cons of both uh, approaches and um uh, like some smoke lamps will actually have combined photoelectric and ionization sensors thank you lee sang uh, from singapore i don't want my singaporean viewers don't get too many uh from singapore so fantastic i love singapore singapore is my favorite asian uh, stop over anywhere. There's only two ways out of Australia. There's basically, uh, well, no, there's three. So there's either east or actually that way, to, because you're viewing this different to I'm uh, pointing that way, east uh, to the United States of America, or there's up through Asia to get to Europe, or then you can now go via um, Abu Dubai or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Hi Dave, I wish to design my own switch mode power supply for my projects in order to save cost. I tear down a cooler master desktop supply. Unfortunately, I couldn't understand this complicated circuit. I think you'll need help to analyze it. Unfortunately, it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite a significant effort to reverse engineer a cooler master switch in uh, power supply. I've done uh, videos on how to um, I did a Rigol oscilloscope front end, and that, but that was basically a tutorial on how to reverse engineer circuits. And it'd be the same thing. Shaker fries? Not sponsored by Maccas. Yes, it's Maccas, none of that Mickey D's rubbish. I don't know, you Yanks are weird. It's Maccas. So there it is, a Cooler Master power supply. Yeah. Uh, that would take a significant amount of time to reverse engineer, I'm afraid. I, like, you can get schematics. I'm sure, um, I don't know, maybe somebody who repairs PC power supplies has actually got the schematics um, somehow for, for these things. Yes, it is a single-sided board. I can see the links on there because uh, you don't want any uh, double-sided rubbish. It costs too much. So thank you very much, Lee Seng, for, I think it's Seng, Seng, um, I think it's a silent eye, for sending in this uh, Cooler Master power supply. I don't know, uh, the, oh, it's a G650M, okay, so all you uh, uh, PC power supply aficionados will no doubt, uh, uh, you know, either say, oh, this is crap, or yeah, that's really good, or that's, uh, like, oh, God, there's so many people who uh, rave on about uh, power supply, <laughs> as if I don't rave on about power supplies, but anyway, um, yeah, this is... Um, it's one with um, like external interconnects uh, like that makes it uh, you know like modular cabling and all that uh, sort of jazz and uh, yeah what main caps have we got there we've got elite branded caps um, ending up 85 geez they're not even 105 uh, temperature so yeah I think this one's probably uh, 
built down to a price, but aren't they uh, sort of, you know, like really neat and efficient? I mean, you get uh, crazy power densities um, in these. Oh, well, not crazy, but, you know, they're, they're really quite uh, good, especially for the price, like really uh, quite amazing. But, yeah, we could go to town analysing this. Anyway, got uh, here's our... Here's our 240 volts mains input. They've really gone to town. They've got a uh, two-stage um, filter there with the uh, common mode chokes. Is that a PTC in there? Perhaps. Oh, no. Uh, is that a, that's PCC up there. Is that, like, is that designed to sense, like, possibly, like, they're not cu physically coupling that. But, you know, it's on a really long, <laughs> really long lead there. It's, like, really flapping around in the breeze. Anyway, uh, bridge rectifier. Looks like we have another gigantic choke here, and then, uh, yeah, it goes into our, basically, our full-wave bridge rectified. Goes into our two caps, and then there's our primary side driving transistors, and our switching transformer. That's going to be our primary side switching regulator there. Got some opto coupler feedback down there, and, oh, there's one jobby on the back. Look at that sneaky little bugger. The others are on this side here, and, uh, would that that'd have secondary regulation no doubt anyway it's going to give you all your different voltages you're going to get your 3.3s and your 5 volts and your 12 volts and i, I don't think yeah do they still do minus 12 volts um not modern power supplies i'm not sure I'm not up with the latest uh, jazz anyway oh look they got a fuse there missed that before uh heat shrunk for our protection and extra heat shrink on the lead over there that's a nice touch so that you don't touch <laughs> i'm here all week so, do we have a secondary side controller down there? What's that? It's hard to... But people say, oh, why can't I read this stuff? It's a, to try and read it on a little couple of inch camcorder screen. It's hopeless. Anyway, there you go. I'm sure you can read that at home. And then they've got uh, just a complete set. Look, a DC card. There it is. So is that for like one particular voltage there, perhaps? That's interesting. But uh, yeah, they ran out of horizontal space. So they had to go vertical. So all the green ones in here, these would all be low ESR jobs. What brand are they? Oh yeah, Capzon. <laughs> there you go, rage in the comments down below about Capzon. Um, but yeah, green uh, traditionally refers to uh, low ESR. Little choke there with a little sluggy in him. And um, yeah, they've hot snotted down that large choke there, but uh, that's all she wrote. And well, all the cool stuff is on the bottom. Look at this. This what makes it, like, to reverse engineer this is uh, quite a task. It's easier because it's single-sided uh, PCB. When it's single-sided like this, does, you know, you don't have to, like, there's just got some jumper links and, you know, stuff like that in there. So it just makes it, like, really easy to, uh, really easy to follow. So you don't have to worry about, like, traces going under parts on the top and then having to desolder the parts. And, you know, often if you want to reverse engineer stuff like this correctly, you do actually have to start desoldering parts and stuff. Anyway, yeah, it's mains in around here. No Notice all the isolation between primary and secondary here, primary over here, and we've got some primary side uh, controllers down in there. Not an extensive teardown, but yeah, to re actually reverse engineer this and get the schematic can be done, of course. I mean, I'm not going to say it's hard, but it's it's very time consuming to actually do this and get it right. You can see like a star grounding point there and little traces running off like that. So, yep, star ground in is important. I've done uh, mentioned that many times in videos. I won't go over it again, but um, yeah, to reverse engineer all this, it's just a it's a pain in the ass. But as I said, I've got a video on how to reverse engineer this stuff. There's multiple techniques you can like. Well, the first thing you usually do is take a high res uh, photo of the uh, PCB, and then you can you know usually stay, get a good first pass approximation with like high res photos, and you can zoom in, and then you can physically print them out, and then you mark off all the traces that you've followed, and and eventually once you've marked them all off with your highlighter, you should eventually come close to a final circuit. But then you know if you've got like traces going under chips and things like that uh you know you have to start buzzing stuff out and or desoldering things and and stuff like that to get the full circuit and then you've got to like you know if you try and physically do it it's a real pain i'd, I'd probably rather uh reverse engineer something like this uh using like uh photos 
So I'd take photos of it and then, yeah, do it that way. Large uh, printouts, um, you know, preferably like A3. It's a good use of like an A3 printer. So there you, there you go. Thank you very much, Lee. Sorry, I can't, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do a video reverse engineering that. But if you please, if you do have the schematic, um, link it and leave it in the comments down below and help out Lee because he wants to uh, learn about this stuff and design his own power supplies. Ooh, it's a Lazy Susan power supply. Terrific. Thank you very much, John Patterson from Tempe, Arizona. I know all my viewers in Arizona. I do like Arizona. Arizona microchip. What do we got? Note. And in the green wrapping, we have, oh, oh, it's a cheap ass. Oh, these things. They're ultrasonically welded. You can actually crack them open. Oh my God, there is no weight in that at all. It's a mains USB charger adapter. I hate being not close to the camera. Um, it's, yeah, it's really annoying. Unfortunately, my main, oh no, I, if I go back to shooting the mail, <laughs> we'll be shooting the mailbag in here. Um, if I go back to, I'm using my Sony NX80 camera at the moment, which has a fixed lens on it. Whereas I normally, for mailbag, I use my old Sony Nex VG30, which has an interchangeable lens, and I can use my wide angle lens. So I could potentially put it really close again and still get the TV angle and so I need to play with that, need to experiment, but there's no weight in that at all. Oh my god, that's going to be a piece of garbage. Oh, second suck of the sav from John here, back in 2016. Oh, geez, you're pushing your luck. Um, this one's a fantastically simple uh, single transistor USB charger that I bought on eBay for 91 cents with free shipping. <laughs> yeah, I can feel the 91 cents of <laughs> value in that. <laughs> wow, it's about the simplest switch mode power supply you can imagine with a half wave rectifier, no optocoupler, interference suppression or secondary side regulation. Yep, I've done a video tearing down one of these. Um, and thankfully, uh, he, uh, for, he started a long term experiment. He figured run all my USB devices using only this charger. I expected the project to last a few weeks at most, but I continued for three years, so it still kept going. Um, he, wow. <laughs> The charger performed flawlessly until about seven months ago when current output abruptly fell to 30 milliamps and discovered that the transistor had gone high impedance. It was still oscillating, but the collector would not pass much current at all. To fix this, he desoldered and baked it in the oven for 20 minutes. We seem to reverse some kind of internal bonfire. Oh, neat. Nice catch. Um, yeah, but you're never going to trust that again. <laughs> <laughs> you had never recovered to full 350, but I was able to supply about 200 for the remainder of the experiment. Wow. Anyway, he's done. John Cad, a complete and utter ripoff of Dave Cad, highly encouraged, of course. Um, and wow, yeah, there's another secondary side <laughs> regulation rubbish. And <laughs> just got a single transistor on the top side, 8.6.8 volt Zena, and Bob's your uncle. Wow, um, like, that's terrible, Muriel. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, John, who has a YouTube channel. Check it out, Dielectric Videos. Oh, I like the name of that. Hang on, this one's got a screw. And yep, that's what you get for your 91 cents delivered. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it's just unbelievable oh there we go yeah yeah he sold it in the transistor down in there oh let's just put in a little wiggle 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 yeah ohm symbol here to try and what that's the fuse um i i think that is the fuse that's fast <laughs> good luck <laughs> oh that's just awful that is terrible oh no i i no. There's only one thing for this, and that's to wirelessize it. So here we go. Yeah. Whoop. Yeah, there we go. Oh. Whoa. It's okay. I got my glasses on. Oh wow, that that was satisfying. That's, <laughs> that was pretty satisfying. Oh, highly recommended. Can't see who this is from unless I, it's FedEx. Uh, can't see, let's have a look. Because they put them in the pouch thing. From Beijing Stone Technology. Oh yeah, I think they emailed me. I don't remember what it actually is, but you know, occasionally companies give me heads up of they stuff, they, you know, they want me, they always want me to do like a review video. You know, they've seen my YouTube channel and uh, they want, oh, yeah, we'd love to do you a review of this consumer gadget or something. It's like, no, I'm not going to review a consumer gadget. But anyone's free 
to send something into the mailbag and I'll look at it for a couple of minutes and go, eh, okay, or whatever. Anyway, I have no idea what they've got. Uh, what is it? Oh, oh no, this looks uh, UART to USB converter. What do we got? Stone tech. No, this is this is really on topic. Not a consumer farting novelty gadget. This is this looks okay. They're um, extolling their virtues. Leading manufacturer of HMI intelligent. Oh yeah, TFT modules. Intelligent TFT modules. Cool. All right. So we've got ourselves. Oh, there it is. Yes, great stuff. I I, I do love these. If you're developing your product, developing your widget, don't don't like uh, reinvent the wheel. Get like one of, you know, something like this, one of these intelligent LCD modules. There's an Australian company that uh, does these as well, uh, 4D uh, Systems, who you've seen on the mailbag before, and they do like, um, you know, they're huge now, and they do, uh, yeah, they, they're a similar sort of thing, like intelligent LCDs like this. You can whack them into your product, especially if you're a, a contract design engineer or something, you know, building some in industrial automated widget or something. These things have, I don't know if this one does, it probably does, but uh, yeah, other, like lots of them on the market, they have built in graphical user interfaces and you can program them, and you can have like a real, you can, uh, you can create for your client a really, fancy like automated system and you can do it in like you know hours days or a week or something rather than like and make it look really fancy with the touchscreen user interface and the whole works because they've got, got all the libraries for you know gauges and dials and all sorts of stuff so if you're doing automated uh, control I presume that this one is that will do something like that I presume uh, UART instruction it's got an MCU on there and it's got yeah it looks like it's got uh, fancy stuff that you can program so yeah these um these smart LCDs um, and they're, they're not cheap you wouldn't put it into a consumer product for example no no way um, that's when you'd roll your own but these things are worth every cent when you want to uh, like design like a you know 10 off 100 of something like that even a thousand of something like that if you're doing it for a big client for some automated factory you know Tesla come to you and we, we want you to set up the new automated production line for our new uh, you know cyber truck or whatever and you've got to have all the automated controls and touch screen you know it's all got to be fancy pantsy and uh, yeah this sort of stuff does the business looks like we've got a uh, a PC interface with that as well cool we'll power it up and see if we can just uh, it's touchy feely uh, see if we can just do something basic with it out of the box all right, I won't spend uh, too long on this. I'll just uh, see if I can get just something basic like loading a demo example or whatever. But I'm down on the uh, download page here. Update validity period has got font creators. So cool, I guess if you want to choose your own custom fonts and things like that, you know, some companies have like, you know, font standards for their company of, you know, consolidate fonts across all their products and thing. Hardware setting, RTCs, so it's got a real-time clock. Uh, keyboard setting, oh, okay, can you, that's the thing I didn't check. Can you actually? Keyboard setting. Uh, whoop. Now we're going to show you. Oh, going to show. Oops, no, it's auto playing. Um, is there is there maybe some digital I/O on here? Some of these have digital I/O, and you can actually uh, program them. So you can actually use this as like a um, well, maybe not this one, but I've seen some that you can use as like a controller. So this is your entire product, and if you just need a couple of button interface or something like that, um, then you can uh, probably do that. It surprised me if it can't. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go that deep. This is not going to be a full-on review. And this is what we've got. It's just a zip file and tool 2019. Um, it looks like it just runs. Um, it's just an exe. Beijing Stone Technology. Software license has expired. Oh. Come on. You sell hardware, not software. Aha. Uh -huh. So here's the uh, USB stick they sent. And... We've got testing projects and stuff like that. Cool. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's flashing. And I'm powering it from the USB. So it's almost as if like it doesn't, the USB doesn't have the grunt to power it, perhaps. Ah. Even running the software on the disk, uh, the USB drive, I like licenses expired. Anyway, I can show you what happens if I plug in an external 5 volt adapter, 5 volts, 3 amps, not sure how much it uh, takes, and can we start a variable, oh, it beeps too, so I want a good old fashioned knob, or a dial, there we go, oh, we can't, oh, no, look at that, so it pops up a key, all right, right we can enter something in there, and oh god, it's all back to front, oh, it's all too hard, 
anyway, we can I don't know, icon rotation. Anyway, um, yeah, you can see it. It's all uh, touchy feely, and they did have like a, a decent looking um, a GUI like interface and stuff like that. Aha! It turns out all you have to do is run a, a an exe utility and update validity period, and it just the software validity period is updated to success. Why bother? That's insane. I just no. Anyway. Success. Can't even click on success. And I mean, like Flynn, I did get some uh, message about it has to be starting compatibility, Windows compatibility mode. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I'm pushing through. Um, oh, look, we've got audio files, video files, fonts, and uh, all sorts of um, dialy, graphic-y things. So these are all the different... These are all the different things. It doesn't seem... It's not hugely polished. Eh, okay. Got a bird, got a seagull, pecking off the last chip. Mine, mine, mine. Moon effect. <laughs> anyway, that's the buttons. Is that all they've got? Like, or is that just, anyway, this is under project 800 by 480. That's the, that's identical to what we've got. Let's see if I can modify something. So these are some of the things you can do. Variables, you can scroll text, variable like an animated icon, slider scale. Art word variable, text clock, dial clock, real-time curve, basic graphics, QR codes, nice. Real-time curve, I'm going to whack a curve in the middle of this, <laughs> just for kicks. I thought I'd be able to draw a curve, but add a real-time curve, this control does not need to allocate a variable address. Add a slider scale down here, it's, it doesn't seem WYSIWYG. Um, I expected, like, where's the actual look of my slider scale? I don't... Uh, look, unfortunately, I'm not having much luck here. Look, if I go to the tool, like I'm trying to actually connect to the thing and uh, online download, USB not connected, nothing. It does look like something is there. We've got a Silicon Labs USB to UART bridge. Oh, I don't think I've got that anywhere else. Yep, yep, it just vanished. So I, I presume like that, that seems okay. Working properly? No? Yeah, the virtual serial port screen doesn't work. Um, it popped up with the error message before. I forget what it says. Uh, com debug? <laughs> Solar Newman com debug. Serial debugging tool one. Novice, novice recommended. Okay, I'll go tool two. Tool one. Nope. Like... Uh, like it should say, you know, display connected or whatever. This should be like a connection thing. It's all, uh, this this software is not impressing me, unfortunately. Um, and all this sort of stuff looks like fairly crude. I'm not impressed with the uh, examples. Uh, like for this thing, like it comes with um, editors and stuff like that. Like you can, you know, you've got image editing tools. You've got an icon generation tool. You've got uh, screen uh, oh, screen configuration. Haven't looked at that. Oh, here it is. No, uh, one serial bar and board rate. And to see, like, how do you actually connect to this thing? To start touch calibration. No, we don't want to touch. No, I don't want to calibrate the touch screen. Nope. Um, yeah, look, I might have an RTFM on this, and I'd love to, but this is like a mailbag. I want things like it should just work. And it's like, it's 10 p.m. here, and I want to finish this video tonight. And, as in, finish my edit, and upload it, and release it at midnight. So, uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't think I'm going to play around with this anymore. Rotation regulation, hardware parameter configuration. See, like, hardware parameter configuration, what does that do? Yeah, like, I'm going to have to, like, go watch the tutorial videos or something, and, like, but I expected, this is obviously the one that's installed on here, um, it's exactly the same, so I expected just to be able to load it up, um, it'd have, like, some connection thing or whatever, and I was trying to, I was actually trying to compile before, where is it? Download to UDisk, right? Look at this, look at this, we've just got failure, 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 failure download jpeg failure like nothing because i presume it's not connected or whatever yeah i don't don't know what the deal is it's got a wave file is that the uh is that the little ping when you is that the uh is it actually playing a um a wave file when you 
when you press the button that'd be cool um yeah i was expecting to be able to like change stuff and just and simply connect to serial port and download and that's it like it should be that easy but i i just i'm not seeing it here um unfortunately i can't spend more time on this so yeah i was expecting more out of this software so if, you, if i get it going i'll whack it on the uh second channel ev blog 2 which is going gangbusters by the way absolute gangbusters um i think i'm on some days i'm i might actually peak uh, ev blog 2 might actually peak above ev blog 1 the main channel in daily views it's just absolutely incredible anyway um yeah so this is uh the software leaves a bit to be desired seems pretty powerful but it, it's just not polished there's no spit and polish in this thing um like and everything's a clock setting everything's a and then do you put it on the main picture file do you where do you put it or do you put it on these other pages like nothing's really nothing's really obvious so yeah i think it's going to take some time to get up to speed on this it's probably quite powerful um and you can probably like do custom like if you don't like the look of their icons and their dials and things like that, yeah, i'm sure you can like import and do pretty much anything you want um so yeah but they could have had like better better examples than that <laughs> and it, software could be easy to use but anyway um thank you very much um stone technology and uh i'll link them in down below because they seem to have a lot of these screens anyway as i said these kind of uh like all in one like a processing application lcd type things for want of a smart lcds for want of a better word they're they're really cool and as i said you can uh, often use them as a standalone one not sure about this one i need to double check but uh yeah like if you could if you want to just hook up a few buttons or uh, this can be the entire interface or something like that it's got serial i assume you can like send out program to send out like serial commands and control things and and things like this so this can become the intelligent controller for your whiz bang product and you can impress your client by having you know all this fancy graphical user touchscreen interface and develop it in no time so that's it for another mailbag if you liked it please give it a big thumbs up and as always comment down below check out my library channel and i'm on all sorts of platforms i'm on BitChute. i'm on library i'm on uh geez i'm even on daily motion although i don't upload there anymore i'm on vimeo for example i'm like killing it with like two views a day or something on average on, on vimeo <laughs> like a rocket taken off uh yeah so yeah, whatever catch you next time <laughs>